All right, so it's taken a long time, maybe it feels like a long time to, to get to this point, but we're finally ready to talk about the Bitcoin system itself. So we've looked at all the different cryptographic primitives that are going to be involved, plus some other concepts like Byzantine fault tolerance and you know proof of work and, and those types of things. And so we're ready to kind of put all the pieces together and look at how you can use these to build a actual digital cash system. Um, I'll say that Bitcoin's pretty complicated. It's pretty hard, even with knowing all of these sort of components that are going to be used, uh, it's kind of hard to, to put it together and digest it in a single sitting. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a pass through um, the protocol. And as you can see, I'll actually use slides. This is probably the only time in this course I'll use slides. And we'll do a pass through the protocol uh, with an emphasis on how those different concepts that we talked about are, are coming together. And then what we'll do is we'll circle back to the very beginning and we'll, we'll do a couple more passes through. And each time we explain the system, we'll focus on different elements. You know, what's going on on the peer to peer network? What's going on at a cryptographic level? What's going on? You know, you know, what are what are different like little pro problematic areas, those types of things. OK, so uh, if you don't get it at the end of this lecture, we will we'll, we will go through it a couple more times. So um, anyways, this is the. Uh, sort of the start of, of actually going through how the protocol works. Okay, so the first thing I want to note about Bitcoin is Bitcoin is designed to actually be uh, a digital currency in and of itself. It's not meant to be a digital rep representation of, say, Canadian dollars or US dollars. It's meant to, um, to actually have its own inherent value. So this is in kind of contrast to a bunch of work that dates back decades, really to the early 80s with people like David Chom, who, who were looking at uh, how can we do digital cash uh, in a way that, that it's sort of digital representations of, of dollars. And we haven't gotten away from that completely. So if you start looking at the back end of banking systems, like say the large value transfer system that banks use to send money to each other, um, there is this notion of sort of digital representations of dollars that that, that move around. Um, but but anyways, Bitcoin is going to be a, a very, very different model. But before we see that, let's let's look and sort of understand what what happens in this this more traditional model of eCash. So in eCash, what's going to happen is you're going to have this uh, digital blob that represents one dollar uh, or one Bitcoin or whatever your currency is. OK. And originally, it's going to be a bank that holds it, maybe because you deposited real money. You've deposited one Canadian dollar in your bank, and now you're like, OK, give me the digital dollar. Um, and so the bank is going to issue to it, issue it to it, issue it. Um, we're going to assume that there's some cryptography without detailing what it is so that uh, it can't easily be forged by Alice. So Alice can't make up a blob that looks like the actual blob that a bank would give her. Um, so the bank will give her this blob and you know maybe there's some signing digital signatures or something on it from the bank or something like that so that Alice can't just make this up out of thin air. And the idea is that if this is going to be a cash like system, Alice will give it to Bob uh, and she can do that and she doesn't have to involve the bank. She doesn't have to say, hey bank, you send the money to Bob. She just gives it directly to Bob, okay? Now we have this problem that if Alice has this blob that she can give to Bob and if the blob is digital, then she can copy and paste it a bunch of times. So she can make 10 copies of it, give one to Bob, one to Carol, one to David. Okay, and these people think that they're all getting, you know, one Canadian dollar, but it turns out that they're just getting a copy. Uh, and and uh, in this case, maybe the first person that deposits it back uh, to the bank will actually get that Canadian dollar, but then all the other people will be out of luck. OK, uh, so this is known as the double spend problem. A lot of eCash systems have it. A lot of systems also have mitigations against it. So there's all sorts of fancy things you can do to, um, if not prevent double spending, at least detect when it happens. Um, you can also rely on traditional legal mechanisms to deal with this particular problem. Um, and, you know, double spending isn't completely alien to traditional finance as well. For example, you can double spend a check, right? You can. Uh, write a check for $100 to one person and $100 to someone else and maybe you only have $100 in your bank. Or even worse, you can write a check where you don't even have the money in your bank. Um, 
So, you know, we do have some mechanisms for, for kind of dealing with this uh, in terms of uh, legal framework and certified checks and those types of things. So it's it's not a absolute killer if your eCash system has this problem, but it's, it's considered very, very poor. OK, um, so most of the work from the 80s up until Bitcoin and including Bitcoin is dealing with how do you solve this double spend in a very kind of sensible way. And so there's one solution that's that's actually very, very nice. Um, and in this case, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to record every transaction that happened. OK, and so what we're doing here is we're sacrificing privacy. So before Alice could send this digital blob, blob to Bob and no one would know about it, okay? Now someone's going to know about it. They're going to know about it and they're going to record it uh, in this ledger. But in this ledger system, um, double spending goes away because let's say that you see three transactions. So consider it from to an amount. So from Bob to Alice, 10. And I, I made the Bitcoin, or sorry, the unit BTC, which is the short form for Bitcoin's currency. Um, so Bob sends Alice 10 Bitcoins, Carol sends Alice 5 Bitcoins. From those two transactions, you can see that Alice's balance is 15 Bitcoin. And if she tries to spend 20 Bitcoin uh, and report that transaction to the ledger, the ledger can say, hey, you don't have 20 Bitcoin. You only have 10 plus 5, uh, which is 15. So sorry, you're, you're sort of out of luck. OK, so we can um, if we report every transaction, if we don't have privacy, uh, if we have transparency instead of privacy, then we can get rid of double spending. Okay, so this is a trick that Bitcoin will play with, although it's not going to be this simple, uh, this system. But let's let's just think of it for now as um, you know, there's a single entity like a bank that's maintaining this ledger. If you want to transact from Alice to Bob, you you don't actually give Bob anything. What you do is you re report to the bank and say you want to move money from your account to Bob's account. Uh, then Bob can check with the bank and see that the money actually uh, got moved. Okay. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll just note is that uh, in order to figure out your balance, uh, there, no, notice that there is no balance here. Uh, so there's no balance that's recorded. If Alice wants to know that she has 15 Bitcoin, what she actually has to do is, is walk through the ledger, every entry in the ledger, and every time she sees money move into her account, she kind of writes it down. And every time money moves out, she writes it down and then she balances them out. Uh, and then the net amount uh, will be her actual balance. And the person updating the ledger kind of has to do the same thing. So every time Alice spends money, they have to make sure that her, her balance is kind of correct. OK. And so this is um, this analogy. Obviously, you could take this data structure in terms of list of transactions and turn it into a list of balances. Um, but uh, I, I just emphasize this point because the way that Bitcoin works and people sometimes have they sort of struggle with this is that uh, Bitcoin is is the ledger itself um, is transaction based. OK, so it's a list of transactions. It's not a list of balances. And this has some ramifications for, for exactly how you implement different aspects of it. Um, it's also why if you use Bitcoin for the first time, you have to download a copy of the entire ledger. Uh, so you have to figure out sort of what everyone's balances are starting at the beginning of time. But these are details we'll, we'll circle back to. So we're going to assume that um, these are the only three transactions that have ever happened. Uh, so Alice has 15 Bitcoin and, and Bob has 18 Bitcoin. And let's say that Alice wants to send five Bitcoin to Bob. Uh, what she's going to do is um, she's going to report that to the person maintaining the ledger. Uh, that will be added uh, to the ledger. And then now if you comb through the ledger and, and you see that uh, Alice had 15 Bitcoin, but then she sent five out. So she's kind of left with 10 and Bob had 18. And then he has another transaction where he gets five Bitcoin. You'll see that his balance is 23 Bitcoin. So we can sort of keep a running tally of, of what the actual balances are. OK, so this is great. Um, this is a nice system. There's no double spending problem with this system, but we have a couple problems. Uh, the first problem is when Alice reports to the ledger, hey, move five Bitcoin from me to Bob, the ledger has to know that it's actually Alice making that request. OK, so we call this access control. So um, somehow the ledger has to know that um, this is Alice uh, and she's the one uh, that's moving it. And in particular, Bob could go to the ledger and say, hi, I'm Alice. Can you move five Bitcoins to Bob's address, even though it's Bob? pretending to be Alice. And so the ledger has to keep track of who's actually who so that you can't steal uh, other people's money. 
So this is where we'll use our first cryptographic primitive. Uh, so we have this digital signature scheme, uh, which is great for sort of identifying people. And so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that uh, Alice has some key uh, that's known to be belong to her, a public key. And Bob also has a public key uh, that's known to belong to him. And now what we can do is we can do digital signatures. So uh, if Alice wants to uh, send, uh, make that transaction and send Bitcoin, what she's required to do is uh, she's required to sign that transaction using the signing key that's affiliated uh, with her public key, okay? And so the ledger will check and make sure that that's actually a valid signature. Uh, and if it's a valid signature, then it will allow it to go through. And the idea is that Bob couldn't make up this transaction because he couldn't sign off on it as if he was Alice, unless if he knew Alice's private key or her signing key. Um, so we use digital signatures to enforce that uh, people actually move their money around. Okay, now the next question is, uh, so the ledger can check that the transaction was signed by a key, and this key belongs to Alice, but how did the ledger decide that this was Alice's key? Like how, you know, a key is just a random number. It belongs to Alice in some sort of sense, uh, but, but how did the ledger decide that, right? In other words, if Bob signed it with his key instead of Alice's key and said that his key was Alice's key. He said, oh, here's a transaction, you know, uh, Alice is sending Bob five Bitcoin. It's signed by KB, which is Alice's key, right? The ledger is going to have to say, no, KB is Bob's key. It's not Alice's key, okay? Um, so what you might think one solution to this would be that the ledger has kind of a list of uh, users and who they are and what their keys are. So when you bind keys to identities, we call that the public key infrastructure or the PKI. And PKI, you know, anytime you have digital signatures, uh, you kind of have a PKI that sort of goes along uh, with the digital signatures to make sure that, that everything works correctly. So what Bitcoin does is actually very, very interesting. What they do is they actually punt on the issue of how do we bind Alice's key to Alice? And what they do instead is um, they make your identity the key itself. So instead of ha living in a world where Alice has a key and Alice sends a transaction to Bob, what we do is we kind of have a world where there's this key and the key has sort of a balance. Like people moved money from one key to another key, okay? Um, and there's no identities anywhere. So you can see the ledger now is, it's not Bob moving money to Alice, it's some key that belongs to Bob moving some key that belongs to Alice, but the ledger doesn't care or try to enforce that the key belongs to Bob or the key belongs to Alice, okay? So what we have is we have what we call a pseudonymous ledger. So if you wanna join the Bitcoin system or get Bitcoin for the first time, all you do is you generate a public key and then you find someone who has Bitcoin, and we'll talk about where Bitcoin comes from in the first place, because that's that's another big question that we have to solve. But assuming that there's some Bitcoin out there, uh, you just generate a public key. You go to someone that has it. They send it from their public key to your public key, um, and, and that's what's recorded in the ledger. And the person maintaining the ledger has no idea who these people are that these keys belong to, or at least by default, that's that's sort of the case, okay? You can even send money to yourself. So you could generate 10 keys, you can send money, you know, around those 10 keys. It's, you're just sending money from yourself to yourself, but as far as the ledger's concerned, it looks like, you know, 10 people are sending money to each other, right? Like the ledger doesn't know, okay? And in general, people will actually have a, a kind of pool of keys. And anyways, there, there's a lot of nuance that, that we haven't covered yet, but this is the basic idea of the system. So in Bitcoin, there's no identities, there's only keys. Keys hold Bitcoin and uh, the private key that corresponds, so public keys hold Bitcoin. Uh, and the private key that can sign for that public key is the mechanism that's used to move the money from that key to a new key. So this is what a transaction might look like. Um, so what you would have is, let's consider that last transaction. So in the ledger, in the simple form, uh, what we did is we uh, took five Bitcoin and we moved it from Alice's key uh, to Bob's key, okay? Now, in reality, uh, things are a little bit more complicated than they see. So the first thing is 
uh, you have a series of transactions. They So the first field, uh, T-9833, I just sort of made that up. That's not even the, the correct naming structure for what transactions look like, but that's just there to show you that uh, transactions have some sort of serial number. There's some way to identify transactions. There's also a whole story under how transactions are identified and, and some things that went wrong and, and, and even how they're identified. But anyways, so we have this transaction and what we're going to do is, uh, this is the, the first thing where, where people's mental models sort of break down a Bitcoin, is what we're going to do is we're going to point at some past transactions where we, we received Bitcoin, okay? And that's what we're going to spend, okay? So if I want to send five Bitcoin, if Alice wants to spend five bit, send five Bitcoin to Bob, um, it's not that she sits there and says, hey, I have a balance of 15, why don't you send you know, five over to Bob and then I'll have a balance of 10 left, okay? What she's actually going to do is she's going to point to past transactions where she received some amount of Bitcoin, okay? Um, and so this, uh, I apologize, but the, the, the actual inputs here don't actually correspond to entries in this ledger, so they're, they're in different amounts. So I apologize if that's a little confusing, but if you just look at the input line of the transaction, um, what you can see is uh, there's some transaction in the past, so we give the identifier for it. And what we're saying is that in that transaction, Alice was given a certain amount of Bitcoin. So in this case, she was given 3.5 Bitcoin. Then there's another transaction where Alice, maybe at the same key or a different key, but anyway, some key that, that Alice controls, uh, was given 2.5 Bitcoin, okay? And so if Alice wants to send five to Bob, what she does is she starts piecing together enough of these previous uh, transactions so that this amount is greater or equal to the amount that she wants to send to Bob. If it adds up to exactly five, then that's fine. She just sends five to Bob and, and she's done. Um, but in a lot of cases, uh, she won't have a, a set of previous transactions that add up to exactly the amount that she wants to send. So what she'll do is she'll say, okay, in some previous transaction, I got 3.5 Bitcoin. There's another transaction where I got 2.5 Bitcoin. Let's put those together, okay? So that's six Bitcoin. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take that six Bitcoin. I want you to take five of that Bitcoin and send it to this person, KB, okay? To this key, which is Bob's key, okay? So that's the transaction that sends it to Bob. And then what she'll say is, okay, there's some Bitcoin that's left over, okay? Uh, in particular, there's one Bitcoin that's left over. And so what she can do is she can send it back to herself. Now, I know this is a 99, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but imagine for a second that this is just a one. So she sends the one back to herself. So she has two inputs, they add up to six. She sends five of the six to Bob and she sends one back to herself, okay? Now, the reason this is 99 and not one is because she's going to pay a fee in order to make this transaction happen who receives the fee, what it's used for, all of that stuff is coming, okay? Uh, but for now, the missing one cent here is, is this sort of fee mechanism and, and we'll, we'll circle back to that like way later, doesn't, doesn't really matter now, okay? And finally, to make sure that Alice actually has signing authority over these two uh, amounts of money, she has to sign it. And notice that maybe in this transaction, she received at one key and in this transaction, she received a different key. She controls both of them. So she can she has a signing key for this and she has a signing key for this as well. Then what she'll do is she'll sign this, thing, this whole transaction twice. So she'll, she'll sign it once with this key and she'll sign it once uh, with this key. So she has five inputs. She's gonna have to sign it five times. Uh, if you have two inputs and they're both for the same key, then you just sign it once uh, with that key. So basically for every unique key that's in an input, you have to sign it. Uh, and then that's it. So then she broadcasts that to the network. And there's, of course, a bunch of fields that are kind of missing, but this is, this is very simple, okay? Another thing that she can do that's a little more complicated is, um, uh, so, so we're going to circle back to this and we're going to spend a lot of time on this, but instead of explicitly sending money to a key that's controlled by Bob, uh, what she can do is she can write a little computer program that describes the kind of person that's allowed to cash this five Bitcoin. Um, so she might say, okay, um, you know, someone's going to show up and uh, they're going to have, there's certain things about them that are defined in this script. 
And if all of those things are true, then guess what? They can spend this five Bitcoin. I'm not going to say who it is. I'm just going to sort of describe uh, what actions they have to take or, or different properties that they might have or uh, different things. So this is very, very vague for now. But anyways, um, this idea of, of turning explicit outputs into scripts is kind of the driving force behind, behind things like Ethereum and smart contracts and decentralized apps and all of this stuff, okay? So I'm just squeezing in this reference just to plant that seed in your mind. Uh, and we're going to circle back to this and, and talk about it in depth. So no, no worries if, if you totally don't understand what I'm talking about yet. Uh, but let's just sort of plant that seed. Okay, so this is great. So that's what a transaction looks like. Um, now, the final question that we have is, okay, who's the lucky person that controls this ledger? Who's the bank uh, that's going to maintain this ledger? And so uh, in the eCash days, you would actually have banks. Uh, so they may, might be maintaining ledgers or, or digital blobs that move back and forth representing money, whatever the accounting system they use uh, would differ. But uh, what would happen like in DigiCash's case, they would have to go around to actual banks and say, hey, will you implement our system? OK, um, what the designer of Bitcoin, uh, whose pseudonym is, is Satoshi Nakamoto, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. But anyways, the inventor of Bitcoin, um, what he uh, decided is uh, what we should do is instead of having one party maintain this ledger, because whoever controls the ledger, first off, you have to sign them up. Right. So you have to go to a bank and say, hey, run this ledger. And the bank will say, we don't want to run this ledger because no users want it. And users don't want it because no bank is providing it. And so you get in this kind of circle where, you know, sort of nobody wants it. Um, so this is one one of the small reasons why maybe companies like DigiCash weren't successful. Um, and the other thing is that the bank has a lot of power, right? If they want to turn off your access to funds or if they want to move money around or if they want to add illegitimate transactions to the ledger or they want to pay themselves, whatever they want to do. Uh, you know, they, they have a lot of power in the system. So what Satoshi said is, uh, wouldn't it be cool if instead of having this ledger be maintained by a particular person, what if we had a peer to peer network? And what we would do is we'd have this whole network maintain it. And wouldn't it be really cool if we run this across the Internet? Um, so anybody could join the network. You could join the network if you want um, with your computer. You would just join the network and you could be um, one of the nodes that's here that's sort of in charge uh, of solving this particular system. So if we have this and from the Byzantine fault tolerant uh, lecture, hopefully you remember that this is going to have to be a lot more complicated than it seems. But uh, anyways, if, if we were able to achieve it, this is sort of what the system would look like. So uh, Alice would have this transaction and she would tell it to a bunch of nodes on the network. Uh, the nodes would relay it amongst themselves. Uh, hopefully the transaction would, would reach all of the nodes. Maybe it doesn't reach 100% of them, but it re reaches a, um, enough of them. One of the nodes, we're not sure how, but one of the nodes is going to update the ledger, add this transaction uh, to the ledger. And now it's sort of done. Um, so what will happen is the fact that it was added to the ledger will circulate around the network. So now um, originally it was one node that added it to the lecture, now to the ledger, pardon me. And now the whole network knows that the ledger was updated. So they all have a fresh copy of the ledger. And then uh, Bob can go and say, hey, what's the current status of the ledger? And they say, OK, well, there's this new transaction. It was just added 9833. And he'll look at it and say, oh, great. That was the transaction where Alice was sending me money. OK. And what's really interesting about this model is that uh, for Alice to send money to Bob, um, what she's doing is she's not actually communicating directly with Bob. What she's doing is she's telling about the transaction, the fact that she wants to move it to Bob to the network. The network's updating it. And then Bob's just learning about it because he's learning that the, the, the ledger was updated from the network himself. So um, they, they never actually directly communicate. OK, another consequence of this is um, because Bob's not a participant other than the fact that he learns that he received some money, uh, Alice can send money to Bob with or without his consent. OK, so generally this isn't a problem because people don't go around just sending money to people. but. Bitcoin is a system where if I want to deposit money in your account, I can do it. I don't need your permission in order to do it. So I can just go ahead and, and put money in it. Um, and so anyways, 
this may be problematic in some sort of extreme cases, but um, that's a property that the system has. Okay, so the final thing is um, we have this ledger and uh, one of the nodes is going to be selected to update the ledger. So we have to figure out which node is selected, how, you know, why, how are they selected. Uh, when they put that transaction in the ledger, we want the rest of the network to say, hey, that's actually a valid transaction. So what's a valid transaction? Like it was properly signed. It was signed by the keys that it was supposed to be signed by. Uh, it didn't spend Bitcoin that it didn't have, right? It, it has all of these sort of security properties that we expect from it, okay? Uh, and then the final thing that would be really nice is that once that ledger gets updated, once that transaction is added to the ledger, uh, you can't go back and change it, right? So one of the nodes can't say, oh, actually, I have a slightly different version of the ledger. It looks exactly the same as yours, but there's just like one transaction missing. Okay, so we, we want to make it so that this ledger is, is tamper proof or tamper evident uh, somehow. Okay, so these, these are sort of the properties that we want uh, from a peer to peer network. So this is how uh, Bitcoin achieves it. First off, what they're going to do is they're not going to update transaction by transaction. What they're going to do is they're going to bundle a bunch of transactions together. Um, so what will happen is they'll listen for a, a window of time. Uh, all the transactions that they see within that window, they're going to group together. Uh, they're going to put it in what's called a block. Uh, the block term should be familiar to you when we talked about Merkle trees. And so they actually explicitly use a Merkle tree. So uh, think of a Merkle tree where all the leaves of the tree are these transactions. The transactions are everything that I showed you with inputs, outputs, transaction ID, and signatures. Uh, so all that stuff is, is in a transaction. Um, we bundle them together in a Merkle tree. So what does the Merkle tree give us? It just gives us a single value. So we now have a single value that is a commitment to all of those transactions. Um, and so anyways, we call that a block. So we have this sort of block of transactions. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to use a hash chain to link them together. Uh, so block 11 will have a hash of block 10 Plus it will have a hash of all the transactions that are inside of it, okay? So it will have a Merkle tree of all the transactions that are inside of it, plus it will have a reference to the previous. So this data structure uh, it doesn't show all the details, but this is exactly what we call link timestamping uh, in, in the previous slide, or sorry, in the previous lectures when, when we were hand drawing this stuff out. Okay, now, this, this is all fine. We still haven't solved one problem, which is who's the node that adds the new block, okay? And there's another problem that, that's sort of subtle that you might not think about, but whoever that node is, uh, they can see a bunch of transactions out of block, see a bunch more transactions out of block, see a bunch more transactions out of block. And what they could do is they could grow this, this chain of blocks, this blockchain. Um, they could grow it faster than anyone could keep up because every time they add new stuff to the ledger, they also have to send it to everyone else. Okay, so everyone else is going to have a copy of exactly the same ledger. That's what we want. We want to, um, we want to have agreement on this ledger and everyone's going to have to check that all the transactions are valid. And so we have this real problem where uh, if you grow the blockchain too quickly, um, you're going to grow it faster and nobody's, if you're the fastest one in the network, other people won't be able to keep up if they have to check all your work and, and make sure that, that everything you're doing is correct. Okay, um, so the idea of Bitcoin is why don't we somehow try to make it so that blocks aren't coming very quickly. And so they picked a sort of number that was kind of arbitrary because no one had done a system like this and it's probably far too conservative, uh, but they say, let's do it every 10 minutes. Okay, so on average anyways, every 10 minutes, a new block is going to be created. And uh, that gives you 10 minutes to check the previous block, uh, which is more than enough time. You know, it, it takes seconds, milliseconds. You know, the hardest time is fetching all the information that you need to check that the block is correct. But anyways, 10 minutes is a very generous amount of time. And then it keeps everyone sort of synchronized. Uh, and it turns out that this is actually going to solve two or three problems that we have. But, but anyways, for now, let's just think of this one problem in isolation, which is if the blockchain grows too fast, uh, then we might not be able to keep up, okay? So how do we make it so that um, 
it takes once every 10 minutes. Not sure yet. Let's let's put that on the back burner, but we'll circle back to that. Okay, the next problem that we have is uh, we want it to be what we call append only. So let's say we have a bunch of blocks that have been created 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And let's say for some reason we don't like what's in block 11. Maybe we bought, we made a big impulse purchase. We went in and bought a Tesla uh, with our Bitcoin and you know we kind of want to roll that transaction back. We want to get that Bitcoin back in our wallet away from the Tesla dealer. Okay, and let's say that transaction happened in block 11. So what we could do is we could go back to the transaction before it or the block before it, which is block 10, and we could propose a new block 11, which looks exactly the same as the other block 11, except for it's missing that one transaction. Okay, then what we'll do is uh, we're going to try and grow uh, our chain. So we'll add block 12 to it. Okay, now the problem is that if blocks are coming every 10 minutes, Okay, uh, then by the time we add block 12 to our, uh, our alternative chain, um, the real blockchain has added block 15 uh, to, to their block, okay, at least on average, okay? And so uh, if we're going to do this attack, and, and we can do it, I, I want to emphasize, because we haven't talked about what's the mechanism that actually makes these things take 10 minutes. But anyways, um, if we're going to uh, if we're going to do something like this, uh, we're going to have this kind of foot race that starts where one person has uh, one chain, another person has a different chain, and uh, they're both trying to grow their chain uh, you know, quicker. And the reason they're trying to grow it quicker is because nodes have to look at, like if I just show you this slide, I say there's two completely legitimate chains. There's nothing wrong with B11 and B12. B11 is missing a transaction, but it's not invalid. Right? There's no, there's nothing to say that that transaction has to be there, right? Uh, so there's nothing invalid about B11 and B12. It's just a different kind of state of the world where that one transaction didn't happen. Okay. So if you're looking, if you're a node and you just turn on Bitcoin for the very first time and you talk to one node and they give you the top chain and you talk to another node and they give you the bottom chain, you have to decide which is the real chain, which is the chain that, that I'm going to consider to be the, the real chain. Okay, and so what we're going to have is a very simple heuristic. Uh, the heuristic is going to say, it actually says something a little more sophisticated than this, but for, for the purposes of, of definitely this sort of introductory talk, we'll, we'll just state it in, in slightly simpler terms. It's going to say, whichever chain is longer, that's the one that's real. Okay, so the top chain, it's longer than the bottom chain, uh, then it's real. And your only hope at getting your bottom chain accepted by all the nodes on the network is you're going to have to get it longer than the top chain, okay? And uh, and so, anyways, that's your goal, okay? We'll talk about what does that mean. You know, what stops you from just growing your chain really, really, really long? Uh, we'll we'll circle back to that. Okay. Um, all right. So so let's talk about uh, the mechanisms themselves, uh, or sorry, what's inside the blocks themselves. So what we have is um, let's start at block 12 here. So block 12 was just proposed. What it has is it has a hash of the previous block, block 11. So we call this the block header. Uh, it's the same, exactly the same as if you go back to the link timestamp, it's just in slightly different format, but it's the same idea. So this is the block header, which is the hash of a previous block, okay? Plus it's the hash of a set of uh, transactions, and these are organized in a Merkle tree. So I didn't show it, but basically you take these transactions, you put them in a Merkle tree, and then the root, the Merkle root, is what's sitting here. Uh, this is the previous block header. You hash those together to make the next block header. Okay, so that's fine. There's another value here that's important that's called the nonce, okay? And what's the nonce doing? So what the nonce is going to do is it's going to let you insert a computational puzzle into creating a new block. So the way Bitcoin is going to work is in order to create B12, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to solve one of those proof of work puzzles that we talked about. And in fact, you're going to solve exactly the same puzzle that we, we actually talked about, which is what you're going to do is you're going to have to hash together 
the Merkle root and the previous block, and you're allowed to add a random number to it, any random number you want. And what you're going to do is you're going to keep on hashing it. So you're going to try n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2. Every time you do this hash, you're going to get a completely different answer. And eventually, you're going to start getting some number of leading zeros. Okay, And eventually, uh, or what the rule will say is um, the new block has to have a certain number of leading zeros. Okay, And more specifically, it's actually the variant of the puzzle where you have a number uh, target and what you have to do is you have to uh, keep hashing with different values of n until this comes out to be a really small number okay a number that's smaller than a certain target okay and the question is okay so who's doing this puzzle the person doing this puzzle is actually every single one of these nodes so all of these nodes once block 11 is announced they take block 11 they take all the transactions that they know about they quickly put in a merkle tree and get the merkle root and then each of them starts solving this proof of work. Okay, they each try to solve n. And the first person to solve it, they broadcast, they say, hey, I just found a solution, uh, B12. They circulate it around the network. Everyone validates that it's, you know, all these transactions are correct. They, they actually hash this amount. This is actually the hash of the previous block. And when you hash these three values together with this, this, this random number, this nonce, that this thing actually comes out as a really small number, a number that's smaller than the current target. Okay, So the whole network is sort of doing this in parallel. They're all trying to solve this puzzle. And the first person to solve the puzzle, they win in the sense that they get to create the new block. Okay, um, Now, why would they do this? Why would they put that much work into creating it? We'll, we'll talk about in a second. So we, we're not sure what incentivizes them to, to actually participate in this network. But mechanically, that's what they're doing. And then what the Bitcoin network will do is it will, um, when you announce the blocks, you also kind of announce a timestamp. And so the timestamp is just a kind of fuzzy assertion of, of what time you created it. And there's some rules about rejecting it if the time is, is really ridiculous compared to what all the network. Notice that there's no concept of time because every node on the network has a slightly different talk, clock. But anyways, what will happen is the blockchain will kind of reconfigure itself. So it will take a bunch of these blocks and it will see how long it's taking the network to solve uh, each of these proof of works in each of the blocks. And what it will say is, um, on average, you know, the network, it's taking a little less than 10 minutes. OK, then what it will do is it will make the, the it will self adjust how hard the proof of work is uh, so that it's a little harder so that it should take on average 10 minutes. Or if the network is taking longer than 10 minutes on average, then it will ease up on the problem. It will make it slightly uh, easier. Uh, and so your numbers won't have to be quite as small in order to satisfy the puzzle. Um, and so this all happens automatically. So there's an algorithm that basically takes as input you know, this is the last set of blocks. This is the amount of time, the, the block interval time it's called. Um, and this is the average of it. And we put the average through this little formula and it tweaks uh, what the proof of work is. It gives us a new reconfigured proof of work. And so the network sort of always kind of is reconfiguring itself so that the proof of work is uh, something that's going to take the whole network on average 10 minutes to solve. OK, this is a lot. I understand that it's, it's a lot to say in one slide. And so we are going to go over it a couple times and eventually it's going to sink in. But um, that's the mechanism that's at play there. Now, the other thing that this does is because all of these um, all of these nodes are trying to solve uh, the new block in parallel is we don't know which node is going to actually solve it. OK, so what ends up happening is it's basically someone gets lucky, right? Someone happens to hash it, everything together with a certain value of n, and it happens to come out uh, with a bunch of leading zeros, and they're like, okay, we, we got lucky. Um, another thing that, that it's hard to understand until we get a little further in the slideshow, but I'll say that um, everybody's, oh, so, so if we look at these three values that you're hashing, um, it, it's very confusing to think, or it, it's easy to be, it's something, to think that all three or all these nodes are solving uh, the same puzzle. OK, so all of them have, you know, they have the exact same value for this. They have the exact same value for this. They all start at zero, one, two, three, four, five. And so whoever's fastest will will solve it first. OK, but 
uh, for reasons that we'll explain, uh, it's true that this value will be the same for all nodes. This value is actually going to differ. Okay, so every node in the network is going to have a slightly different value. They're all going to be valid. They're all perfectly valid numbers to have here, but they're all going to have slightly different numbers here, or not even slight, they'll, they'll be completely different numbers. Okay, and so all of them are solving a different proof of work. So when node one solves it, they have one number here. So there's one end value that's going to solve it for them. And when node two solves it with a different value here, there's a completely different end value. Okay, so there's no saying really who, who's going to solve it first. Okay, one of them is going to get lucky uh, based on a combination of, of having a certain value here and, and finding the end fast enough that solves it for their particular block. Okay, so it's essentially like picking a node at random. Now, obviously, if you can hash faster, if you can try more values of n than your, your, uh, your neighbors or the other nodes on the network, you're going to have an advantage. Okay, and so you're in a kind of race. You're, it's a, com a competition between all these nodes uh, to try and be the one to solve it. And there, there is an actual reward to solving it that we'll talk about in a second. So everyone wants to be the, the node that actually solves it, okay? And whenever you have a race, it's, your race is usually configured one of two ways. So the first common way of configuring a race is you can think of it like a foot race. So in a foot race, the fastest node always wins, okay? So if, if you run a race 100 times in a row, the fastest person will win the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, okay? So basically, once you become fastest, you win 100% of the time, okay? So that's one way of, of setting up a kind of competition. The other way you can think of is kind of like a lottery. So let's say that you go out and you buy five lottery tickets, and your friend goes out and they buy 100 lottery tickets. Your friend has an advantage, okay? So uh, they have more lottery tickets than you. The chances that they win the lottery is bigger than you. Okay, but if you run a hundred lotteries in a row, right? There's no saying that you, just because your friend has more lottery tickets doesn't mean he's going to win every single lottery, right? Uh, he'll win more often than you'll win, right? So if he has twice as many tickets, he's going to win twice as much as you, but you're still going to win some amount of the time. So the way this is set up, and you can, you can sort of convince yourself that it's true, uh, is it's set up like a lottery. So the fastest node is going to win faster, or it's going to win more often, winning by you know solving the proof of work, solving the puzzle. Uh, fast nodes are going to solve more puzzles than slow slow nodes, but slow nodes aren't going to never solve a puzzle. It's not like the fastest node will always solve a puzzle. So what you can do is you can think of kind of like a pie chart of um, this this person you know she has ten percent of of the network's computational power. She's going to solve the puzzle about ten percent of the puzzles. And this person maybe has 30% um, of the, all the computation on the network, and so she's going to, you know, she's going to solve 30% of the puzzles. Okay, so everyone's going to solve puzzles in proportion to the amount of computation that they have. Okay, that's the ideal case. Uh, we'll talk about some things called like selfish mining and a, a few strategies where you can uh, kind of do better than the ideal case. But anyways, in the ideal case, that's sort of how it's set up. Okay, so the final thing is uh, we have these nodes. They're solving these proofs of work. To solve a proof of work, it's a, a moderately hard puzzle. So you're devoting computational power to solving it. That actually takes hydro. It takes electricity. So why on earth are you doing this? Why would, why would you join the Bitcoin network if all you're going to do is waste your computer's cycles trying to solve these particular puzzles? Okay, um, so the answer is that you're going to get paid. The way you get paid is if we go all the way back uh, to the transaction, uh, you'll notice that if you recall, in this transaction, we put a certain amount of money in. So we put six Bitcoin in, five went to Bob, 99 went back to us. That means that there's one you know, Bit cent uh, that's left over okay, of this transaction. What that is, is it's a fee. And it's a fee that's going to be collected by the miner that takes this transaction and puts it in a block. So one of the, you're going to put this transaction out on the network. One of the miners is going to select this transaction, put it in their block, and actually solve it, solve the puzzle for that block. Then they're going to get that one bit sent, and they're going to pay themselves with it. And the way they pay themselves is they'll actually add it as a new transaction. So every block has a transaction where the miner uh, so sorry, we call the nodes that solve a block miners. 
because uh, it's it's kind of like mining for gold. But anyway, the node that solves the block, um, they're actually going to have a transaction where they're like, okay, these are the, the, the 100 transactions I'm including. If you add up all the fees, they add up to this amount. And so I'm going to go ahead and pay myself this amount and I'm going to move it to this exact key. Okay, and because that transaction is specific to them, that's also the answer to why does everyone have a slightly different value for this, this value in the proof of work? Uh, because everyone's going to have a transaction in there that pays themselves. So this node's going to pay, is going to have their public key somewhere in one of these transactions that ends up in this Merkle root. This one's going to have their public key. Since every public key is different, remember if you, even if you hash data that looks almost the same, if there's any small difference as small as one bit between two pieces of data, the hashes come out to be completely different. Um, so every node is going to have a completely different value here because the set of transactions that they're hashing is going to be completely different. Well, mostly different. Um, or sorry, it'll probably be mostly the same, but the, there's going to be at least one transaction that's different. Um, the other thing is that the miners can or the nodes can uh, include any transactions they want. So maybe, and, and anyways, let's shelve that issue as well. well. We'll circle back to that issue. Okay, so what they'll do is uh, in, you know, whoever mines, let's say block 14 here, what they'll do is they'll calculate all the fees across them and then they'll pay themselves. Okay, uh, so that's great. So that gives them an incentive. And as long as the fees are uh, more than the hydro that they're spending on doing this computational puzzle, then the whole thing kind of makes sense, okay? Um, now, the other thing is that uh, fees also incentivize you to validate that certain transactions are right. So let's say that you're looking, you just joined the network and this is what the blockchain looks like. So um, what you're supposed to do, what we want you to do is check that every block is actually valid, okay? So let's say that block 14 has just been announced, okay? And right after it's been announced, you kind of have a choice. You could, in one world, you could start working on block 15. And remember, block 15 has an explicit hash to block 14. So if you're going to work on block 15 and trying to solve the puzzle for block 15, you have to explicitly hash in block 14, okay? So if you solve this, you can't change which is the previous transaction. The previous transaction is fixed. It's uh, fixed uh, in this before you even start working on it, okay? The alternative is that you might say, uh, I I don't like this block 14, I really wanna be the person to solve block 14, you know, for whatever reason, and so I'm gonna compete uh, with block 14, okay? Now, let's say that for some reason there's actually something that's invalid in this block 14, okay? So we should be rejecting this. If you just, as soon as you see, hear about block 14, uh, if you don't even bother to check it and you just start working on block 15, then once the rest of the network realizes that there's something wrong with the block 14, they're all going to be working on our correct block 14. And even if you solve block 15 first, they're going to reject your solution to block 15 because it extends an invalid block. Okay, so you're going to lose, you would get paid all the fees in block 15, but only if the rest of the network accepts that this is this is a proper uh, is a proper block. And there's nothing wrong with your block itself, it's just that you built on a block that wasn't proper, okay? So you're gonna sacrifice all the fees, plus you're gonna waste a lot of time working on something. And so before you start working on block 15, it pays, it actually is incentive compatible to check that block 14 is correct, okay? So when you take this across the whole network, basically what you have is a situation where all the nodes are kind of ultra paranoid that other nodes are doing things wrong, and if they get kind of involved with, with nodes that are doing things that are wrong, uh, then they're going to lose money at the end of the day. And so they're going to check everything. And so all the nodes are going to check every transaction and every block. And that's what gives you a lot of security around blockchain. So blockchain um, you know, has a list of transactions and, and everything is like cross-validated by everybody on the network. And so uh, when something comes out and the network really accepts it and says, yeah, this is, this is true, you can, you can really bet on it being true because they have real money at stake uh, in terms of it being true. Okay, so it pays to verify. Uh, the final thing that we have is, uh, we haven't talked about where Bitcoin comes from in the first place. So we assume we have this system and a bunch of people have Bitcoin. Well, how did they get Bitcoin? How did the very first person get Bitcoin? You know, was it that the inventor of Bitcoin paid themselves a million Bitcoin and then they, 
they just sort of distribute it out to their friends or whatever. So that that's one way you could run a system. The problem with that is that most people wouldn't want to own a currency like that because it just enriches the person who created it. Um, there's other ways where you can create a big set of currency and then kind of auction it off. So we've seen that that's more of a modern twist on, on how you might bootstrap a currency from scratch. The way Bitcoin did it is uh, it kind of trickled out and it's continuing to to this day to trickle out new Bitcoin. So every 10 minutes when the block updates, there's also new Bitcoin that comes into circulation. And the fact that the blockchain is updating every 10 minutes, we said that's to slow down the network so that everyone can validate. They have time to do all this validation. We just saw why validation is so important because it pays to validate. Um, but it also serves the purpose, an additional purpose of um, of making sure that new money doesn't come into circulation too fast. Okay, And so what Bitcoin does is it actually has a fi fixed schedule where a certain amount of Bitcoin, uh, you know, 50 Bitcoin is released uh, every 10 minutes. And then after a certain number of blocks, then it halves to 25 and then it goes down to 12.5. Uh, and so uh, usually it takes, you know, maybe a couple years before it halves that kind of thing. Okay, so they have this fixed schedule. It's really interesting. And um, at the end of the day, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, that that is created now bitcoins themselves are divisible. They're actually divisible to, to a lot of decimal places and so uh, One Bitcoin isn't the smallest amount of unit. You can send something that's a lot smaller than one Bitcoin um, So it's it's not really like there's only 21 million because that's not a big number actually if for currency So there, there's a lot more units than than uh, 21 million, but um Anyways, I digress. Uh, so this initial distribution, what they did is they just trickled it out. And who are you going to pay, right? You're going to trickle it out to who? And so they said, well, we have these miners. They're getting fees anyway. We want them to do this proof of work. This proof of work is costing electricity. So why don't we give it to the nodes that are actually creating these blocks, that are solving these blocks? So uh, when newly minted uh, Bitcoin comes into circulation, uh, then we give at every block uh, the node that solves it. So we call them miners. Um, the node that solves it, they include a transaction. It's called the Coinbase transaction, where they pay themselves the set of all the fees, and then they pay themselves what's called the block reward, uh, which is the newly minted Bitcoin um, that comes into circulation. And everyone checks that they don't pay themselves too much, right? That they don't they don't pay more than they're they're awarded. Uh, according to the schedule of, of how much uh, Bitcoin should be trickling into the system. Uh, and so the nice thing about this is that, um, so this slide's actually a, li a little old, and, and so this is maybe a little less true, but it, it's still somewhat true. Um, especially in the early days, the, the cost, so anytime you create money, let's say you go out and you create a coin, the coin isn't free to create. Okay, so let's say you make a $2 coin, a toonie in Canada, as we call it. Uh, you know, you have to go out and you have to get the metal, like maybe it's made out of nickel and you have to plate it and all of that stuff. And so it's going to cost you some amount to make it, but it's not going to cost you $2 to make a $2 coin generally. Okay, usually you're in big trouble when the, the actual, you know, the value of the currency intrinsically is, is more than what it's actually worth in terms of uh, what it represents. Um, but anyway, so let's say that to, to create a toonie, it costs, you know, 10 cents. Um, so for 10 cents, you can create a toonie, but once you've created that, now it's worth $2, right? And so the difference between the $2 and, and the 10 cents, right, the $1.90, we call that seniorage. So seniorage is just a really fancy term for uh, how much the money's worth subtracted so when you subtract off how much it actually costs to create it, okay? So what uh, miners are doing is they're making money through seniorage, where they're putting a certain amount of electricity costs and other costs, you know, the cost of the computers that are, are uh, solving these proofs of work. And now nowadays it's, you know, using chips uh, that are specific to, to solving this particular problem. So they're gonna have all these costs, these overhead capital costs, plus they're gonna pay for their electricity and the air conditioning uh, to keep the all their equipment cool. And, you know, there's, there's a whole slew of, of issues that we'll talk about later. Um, but anyways, uh, hopefully that uh, at the end of the day, all this costs less than the amount of money that they're getting in terms of newly minted coins and fees. OK. Um, and what happened traditionally is the amount of money they were getting was actually uh, a lot more 
than the amount it was costing. So the scene ridge was, was really, really large. And as a result, what they did is they wouldn't charge users any fees or very, very small marginal fees. And so you could get your Bitcoin um, transaction processed with, with almost no fees. And even if you included no fees, uh, it would still get transacted. And I realize I'm, I'm sort of jumping the gun a bit here too, because fees are voluntary. So uh, the way that, that it works in Bitcoin is it, it's kind of like it's kind of like an auction where you you give a transaction that has a fee and the miner can include it or not. Uh, and if you're if you don't pay enough fees, then they won't include it. And if you include enough and there's no line in the sand about what that level is, um, it's up to the miner's discretion. It depends on how busy the network is and things like that. But if you want to get to the front of the line and make sure your transactions process, then you would in in include a higher fee. And so originally the scenerage totally offset the fees. And so uh, even if you included little fees or no fees, it would still get processed. Now uh, things are a lot more competitive. Uh, and so it's it's harder to get things processed uh, without fees. Um, the other thing I mentioned is that uh, circulation is limited to 21 million Bitcoin. Um, it's going to take a long time. You know, we'll, we'll I, I usually say in class, we'll all be dead because I can see everyone I'm looking at. And I know that nobody's probably going to live till 2140 unless if there's some life extension uh you know new technologies or something like that but now that i'm putting this on the internet uh maybe we have youtube in the year 2140 and you're actually watching this for the very first time in 2140 and so you might be alive when this uh circulation actually limit actually gets hit um but anyways it's a long time away a long time away we're not that worried about it but there is some research that looks at how does the economics change will this system actually continue to work when you remove the mint uh based incentive and you just have the fee based incentive and, and it turns out that there's some theory to suggest that that maybe this system doesn't work uh the way that we think it will uh it might not maintain its incentive compatibility okay uh the last thing i'll talk about real quick is uh we talked about traditional eCash having this double spend problem okay and we said well we have this ledger system and so in a ledger system we get rid of it right if you try and spend the same money twice, they can't be added to the ledger. Both of those transactions won't be added to the ledger because they're invalid. Okay, it's invalid to have both of those spends in the same ledger. And with this whole blockchain data structure or consensus mechanism or whatever you want to call it, uh, we have a way of enforcing that only things that are valid are added to the blockchain. Okay, so all of this is, is really, really neat. But the problem that we, we fail to take into consideration is that there might be more than one ledger. And in particular, uh, there might be a ledger that's exactly the same, a blockchain that's exactly the same up to the very last block. And then let's say that there's two um, there's two two miners that basically solve the blocks at exactly the same time. OK, uh, and now you have an opportunity to actually do a kind of double spend. Uh, so what you can do is you can broadcast a transaction, let's say you go into a coffee shop, you're going to buy a coffee. And so you're going to uh, broadcast a transaction that pays the coffee shop, uh, the equivalent of that amount of money. And then you're going to walk out with your coffee. Now that transaction doesn't actually become final until 10 minutes later. Okay, till someone solves the block, maybe it's two minutes or whatever, it, de it depends on uh, chances on the chance, but on average, it's going to take about 10 minutes. Okay. In that window of time, what you could do is you could broadcast a second transaction that spends the exact same inputs, uh, but it sends them to a different person, like to yourself. So now there's two transactions, and it's true that both of them can't be included, but which one will be included? If miners see both of them, which one are they going to include? So some of them might include the first one they see. So you might have to be really fast, or maybe when you uh, do the coffee one, you don't broadcast it very well. Uh, and, th and then you really over broadcast the other ones. Um, the, you know, these terms don't actually make a lot of sense when you when you look at the underlying technology, but I'm trying to give you this flavor of um, the fact that, that different parts of the network could see different transactions. The other thing you might do is you might have different fees. So for the second transaction, you really want that one, uh, the one where you're not paying the coffee shop, you want that one uh, to be included. And so maybe you increase the fees uh, uh, in order to do it. Um, 
So you're not sure which of the two are going to get included. There's still probably a high probability that the first one will be the one that gets included just because it went first. But the coffee shop might just wait to see that you broadcast the transaction and then give you the coffee, okay? Uh, and then you'll do the second, you'll broadcast the second one. And with some probability, uh, the second one will actually get included in a block, okay? Uh, so what you want to do is if you're a coffee shop, this is in theory what you want to do. In theory what you want to do is you want to wait till the transaction makes it into a block. And then because different miners might solve blocks around the same time, there might be like some confusion over which is the longest chain uh, right at the very tail end of the blockchain. So we're going to go through this in a, in a lot more detail uh, in a sec or in, in future lectures. but. Um, there could be some confusion right at the tail end, uh, but eventually one of those chains will become longer, okay? And once a transaction has about six blocks, it's in a block and there's about six blocks that have been built on top of it or, or that extend that particular block, the chances of it getting reorganized is, is very, very slim, okay? So there's some volatility at the end of the chain. Um, and uh, okay, so, so the, the common practice is Wait till the transaction is actually in a block. And not only then, you should actually wait until a bunch of blocks have been added to the end. Then you're really, really sure that that transaction's in the ledger and it's probably never going to change. Um, so that's great advice, but if you're a coffee shop and you're waiting, say, six blocks, that's like an hour. So you're not going to accept payment in Bitcoin and then wait an hour to see that it's fully confirmed and then give the person their coffee. Okay, so this is a little bit problematic. So what happens in practice is, well, there's lots of ways of stealing a cup of coffee. And so usually they'll just give you the coffee because they kind of trust you, right? And maybe if the, if the coffee shop, if enough people do this like really highly technically sophisticated attack enough times and they lose money, then maybe they'll stop accepting Bitcoin, okay? So in general, people just sort of ignore it. But if it's a high value transaction, like say you're moving a lot of money onto an exchange or off an exchange, then they will actually wait that one hour uh, to make sure that everything's confirmed, okay? So there is this concept of double spending that applies in Bitcoin. It's slightly different than, it's not sending the same money to two different people. Well, it kind of is, but anyways, it, 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 it's similar in flavor, yet kind of mechanically different uh, from what we originally introduced as the double spending problem. So I just wanted to, ha you know, kind of throw up a slide there so that we can walk through kind of what those differences are. Um, and we'll circle back to these as well. Okay, so that's that's it. And uh, next time we'll we'll do a second pass through the same material and we'll pick up other details.